the phylum periphera will be the first group of animals that we will look at in our study of comparative anatomy and evolution. And the nice thing about the phylum periphera is they're quite simple. That what we have to realize with this phylum is that they are really not considered to be true animals. And the reason so, not true animals, is that they don't have the three germ layers that all animals will have. They're very simple and they are what we consider to be colonial, just like the Volvox was with the green algae, the uh, sponges are going to be colonial. Peripheral means porous. In other words, they have a bunch of these peripherals, these holes in which water can get into the organism, and from there the nutrients can be obtained and then distributed throughout. So rather than have specialized tissues, this, this is an organism that has specialized cells. Here's a little idea in this case here. This is a yellow tube sponge, and they're pretty large. This this person here, he's a diver. He's approximately five foot nine, five foot ten, and it pretty much goes from here all the way down here. So these sponges can be quite large. They are all going to be aquatic, and that's going to be typical with many of these organisms that have no symmetry, or at least in as well as have uh, radial symmetry. So we see these specialized cells. We have these collar cells, these amoebocyte cells. These are all going to play a role in light of getting nutrients into and out of this organism's uh, body, shall we say. And although they don't have a true skeleton like you and I think of a skeleton, they do have a structural support. That structural support can be either made of as calcium or silica. And that will, um, as you recall from the video that we saw, that would be a, it gives it some sort of structure other than just the cells themselves. The also is that there's a huge group of what we consider to be sponges. We have here things that we could see here on the, on the California coast. This purple uh, coloration, this is called, it's an encrusting sponge. And all of the purple here basically is going to be a form or one of the stages of the sponges here. This is a nudibranch which literally can eat on the sponge. So these nudibranchs are unique in that these particular sponges, if they are toxic or if they have a particular poison, the nudibranchs can actually incorporate them. We're going to see these organisms later. They are basically good. They are mollusk, phylum mollusca. And they're nudibranchs. Nudibranchs. Okay, and they're actually going to get their oxygen from these little plumes that they have. The other type of sponge here, this is called a red volcano sponge. It too can be found out in Monterey. And just like the other uh, sponges, it, it will have that really st elaborate structure either made of a silica or calcium. Reproduction can either be asexual or sexual. When it is a form of sexual reproduction, because these organisms are aquatic, they're going to release a lot of gametes. Because the sperm and egg have to be released into the open ocean, they have to have an abundance of these gametes in order to increase the chances of fertilization. This type of releasing of gametes in the um, environment is called external fertilization. And we're going to see that uh, quite a few aquatic animals do that, and in that process is going to cost them a lot of energy in order to produce the number of eggs and sperm. Obviously in this case here it would also be external development. And we'll see how they have different stages in the developmental state, um, at least in the nadaria. But for the sponges they are porphyrous, they are porous, they're pretty much a dead end in terms of the animal kingdom. They still exist today. They're very simple colonial organisms. Nadaria, basically they're going to be the first group of true tissues. They're going to have nematocysts, or those singing cells which are unique to nadarians. We're going to see two types, the polyp and the medusa, or as David Attenborough said, the medusa is often named after the mythological creature or the woman who had a bunch of snakes on her hair, as her hair. And they're going to alternate between two life cycles. We're also going to see a very simple type of gastrovascular cavity. It's not a true um, 
uh, digestive system like you do have in terms of from mouth to anus, but it's the type of cavity in which it's going to be specialized for digesting these the foods. There are going to be a whole bunch of these types of organisms from the corals, the jellyfish, hydrozoans, and each of them will have some similarities as well as some differences. So out here in terms of Monterey, we also see these things called, these These are brown nettle, nettles, yeah, and they will sting. These brown nettles, they can go up to anywhere from 20 to 30 feet in terms of their length. And so they're unique in terms of they drift along, pulsating, they have a nerve net. So they don't have a brain, nor, they, nor do they have ganglia, but these jellies are going to have some sort of pulsating nerve net that allows them to beat and move through the actual ocean itself. So that's a brown nettle. Over here is another gel type of jellyfish. This is called an egg yolk. Quite similar in terms, you can tell why in terms of the egg yolk. And when these organisms die, they will be food for many other scavengers along the ocean bottom, including um, sea stars. And right here we see the two distinct stages in terms of the polyp stage and the medusa stage with respect to the um, organisms. And we're going to see here inside it is going to be the gastrovascular cavity, and they're going to have the gastrovascular cavity there as well. We're going to look at in terms of these organisms because they have radial symmetry. They have what we call an aboral side and an oral side. So it depends on where the mouth is located with respect to these organisms that have radial symmetry. The simple life cycle, as I said, they can either reproduce asexually by budding, thus making many, many clones of themselves. And once they are in an adult medusa stage, the medusa stage will have these specialized structures in this area up here called gonads. And these gonads are going to be uh, specialized for either producing egg or sperm. So subsequently it's very possible for some to be hermaphroditic and have their specialized gonads to produce egg and others produce sperm or release those down to the ocean, or they might be different genders. Once the zygote is formed, and the zygote is essentially the fertilization in which the egg and the sperm nuclei fuse to recombine the genes, these zygotes will undergo mitotic division and ultimately form a polyp. The polyp in this case is going to be sessile, non-moving, and it can produce many, many, many more new organisms by budding. The medusa is non-sessile. It is actually going to be an organism that is able to um, swim or at least drift along with the currents of the ocean. So as we see in this case here, the classic radial symmetry, here we have a, this is called a, literally, a fish-eating anemone. And it's possible for you to see its mouth. And from its mouth, you're going to have all these different tentacles that are going to radiate from that central area. So subsequently, this fish-eating anemone, I did have a friend one time come down and take an egg, hatch the egg, it was raw egg, and the anemone just closed in on it in terms of eating. And then we're going to have, in this case, this is another type of nadaria. This is a staghorn coral. So you see that they don't have any particular, uh, a large organism. They don't have any symmetry as a large organism, but individually, if I was to, if I was to be able to magnify here, I would see these small, small little polyps, very similar to the medusae, which would have individual radial symmetry. So here we have, again, the possible, uh, reproduction by either asexual or gametes. Obviously, if you're going to be stationary, you're going to have the gametes released into the ocean and rely on the currents to drift and hopefully get those gametes to fertilize each other. Hydra, this is the organism that we're going to use in class as an example. They are very small. But what I like about this diagram is that it shows you how it has the endoderm and the ectoderm in this middle layer going to be the mesoderm. So it has the true tissues that all animals have. It will also have a gastrovascular cavity, meaning one way in, one way out. Tentacles, and these tentacles, those are where the stinging cells are going to be, and the nematocysts. We might even be able to see some in our observation of the hydra in class.